Please, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, just uh, before we start, I would like to mention that I'm talking, about, I'm talking about Western music, and if you're not sure what Western music is, it's the kind of music you hear every day, and here is an example of this music. <laughs> So perhaps you recognised one or two songs there. I'm going to talk about the structure of the pitch in this music, uh, which we find very familiar. Um, this kind of uh, pitch structure is dominating Western culture, probably because of the political um, influence of Western music. Uh, it has something to do with the history, <coughs> something to do with the history of Western music that we have this kind of music, right? And there's also something about psychology which makes it easy for us to perceive this kind of music. And I'm going to talk today about the psychological, as psychological aspects. So how do we perceive and understand this musical structure? Um, major minor tonality is in fact the topic, which means the system of major and minor keys or tonalities. Um, so in this system, we have two possible tonic triads. These things are called tonic triads. That's here, tonic and taiklan, and um, and we have different scales, which in music notation have these uh, sharps and flats at the start. Um, it's based on the idea that you can have several melodies at the same time, which is called polyphony. Um, and the origin of polyphony is also the origin of this system. And I'm going to talk about how polyphony began, and after that, how the major minor system began. Um, so this is another way of looking at the foundation of this system called the major minor system. Uh, music in major keys can often be described in chord progressions, and the chords are often related to these seven chords, which are the seven steps of the scale of C major. And so I can play it on this thing here. These are the chords that are notated there, and then the minor ones sound like something different, right? Um, and there are different ways of playing them, and there's some ambiguities, but basically uh, almost all major minor music can be relatively easy reduced to these kinds of chords. So we want to understand what chords are. Um, so we have some very simple questions that I want to ask, kind of naive questions, like, why is the sky blue? How do I explain that to my child? How the sky is blue? How do I explain it to my child? that most music we hear on the radio is in major and minor keys. Where does it come from, right? Why is major minor tonality like it is and not very different, with different patterns of pitches? Where does it come from and how does it work? Um, and in order to answer this question, we need to look at it from different disciplines, in particular from humanities and sciences, which have a quite different approach. Uh, so humanities would include history, music theory, and philosophy. And um, people in these disciplines tend to have a humanities approach to thinking, which I wrote here as subjective in the sense that we understand our own experience. Uh, specific, we look at specific pieces of music or kinds of music. And relativist, everything that you say which might be true is in fact only true relative to the context. This is a humanities way of thinking that. And there are also scientists in acoustics, neurophysiology, and psychology have a quite different way of thinking. They try to be objective, standing away from the object of research. They try to make general statements, which could be true in all places and all times. And they tend to be positivist, which means they think they can discover the absolute truth. And so we have totally different ways of thinking about this, and I'm going to try to combine them a bit today. So here is an example of what we're looking at. This is a piece of music from the late 12th century, um, uh, so a little bit of history. In Notre Dame in Paris, people were singing polyphony, which means different voices singing different melodies, in the 12th century and earlier, but it was not being notated. And towards the end of the 12th century, people started to write this polyphony down, and it's a bit unclear whether it was composition or transcription, because it was based on an oral tradition of singing which was existing in the church at that time. And this piece, Vida uh, Omnes, um, sounds a bit like this. Actually, we have no idea what it sounds like. We think it sounds something like this. Um, 
Um, so you can hear from this that there are several voices singing and they're making chords, what we think would today be chords, but um, the way people perceived in the 12th century was completely different because they didn't have a concept of chords. They had concepts of different melodies at the same time. So it's very hard for us to imagine how they experienced that music. And if you look at the music notation, you find very strange things happening. For example, here we have these tones, like this. These are the four tones that I put in the circle. Um, a jazz guitar player would call this an added ninth chord, a major triad with an added ninth. Um, and then you would think that's a very modern chord. We don't have chords like that in the 12th century. But there are all kinds of strange chords happening quasi by accident right, in this music. And I'm very interested in these accidents. These numbers here are the chord notated in semitones, 0247. So that would be like this. 0247. 0247. We can talk about these chords either in semitones or relative to the diatonic scale. So I'm coming in next. Uh, here's another strange chord out of this same work of music. The word work is a bit odd. Uh, this looks like a dominant seventh chord, uh, which, in, which in semitones is called 0368. And we thought that chord was invented around 1600, but in fact here it is happening in the 12th century. Uh, we want to explain some odd things like this. Here's another odd thing. In the 14th century, uh, at the end of a phrase, the music often ended with this thing called a double leading tone cadence, which sounds like this. Which sounds like this. Um, so in everyday music that you hear today, you are used to something else like this. Or this. That's the sound we're used to. And this sound from the 14th century is quite odd to our ears. And so if we want to understand the history of tonality, we have to try to explain strange things like that as well. Um, so what actually happened in the history of Western music is that uh, polyphony gradually emerged. And so people started singing in parallel fifths, which sounds like this. which sounds very medieval. Um, it sounds like a medieval cliche that you would use in a Hollywood movie, right? This kind of singing was happening for several centuries before the Notre Dame piece we looked at. And um, gradually polyphony became more complex. Uh, for example, a phrase in parallel fifths could cadence onto a unison like this. Uh, so on the way from the perfect fifth interval, there would be another interval called a third, which is considered to be dissonant, and then it would resolve onto a unison. Uh, so if there was contrary motion, one melody goes up, the other one goes down, you can create new intervals. And this gradually happened over centuries that the polyphony became more complex. And as these voices combined, new combinations of pitches happened, and people here were hearing these combinations for the first time. So um, I'm, I'm interested in that perception. Um, so we could also ask the general question why were people suddenly writing polyphony when they had been singing melodies for so long? Well one reason is that um, the glory of God can be represented by a very complex structure and you see this in the Gothic architecture. Something similar happened in the glorious uh, polyphonic music. So um, here is my assumption about the frequency of occurrence of a chord. How often does a chord happen? The prevalence, I'm using this word like Häufigkeit in German, of a musical element which could be a chord or any pattern in a given historical period, which could be medieval, depends mainly on its consonance and dissonance. That's what I'm saying here, CV. I'm going to assume that the prevalence, how often something happens in a musical score, is a measure of its consonants at the time when the music was written, which is different from today. And I'm going to talk about chords because I think chords are the foundation of tonality. I'm sorry, I'm going very fast today. I'm assuming that musical chords are the foundation of tonality. And um, here are some different methods of solving this problem. So 
you might say, okay, we have a big scientific problem here. We want to understand what chords and tonality are. One option is that we do listening experiments. So people hear sounds and they make some judgments about it. And that way you can find about the modern perception of how people today perceive those sounds. Another option is you take a database of musical scores from history and you try to analyze it to find out how people perceived in the past. And this can also be divided into two other sections. Here we can look at vertical consonants and dissonance, which is simultaneous tones. Uh, in a musical score, the, the tones are written simultaneously this way, and the time axis is here, right? So, so vertical is like in a musical score, you have a chord. Simultaneous tones. Or we can look at horizontal consonants and dissonance, which is how tones go together one after the other. And we can ask different questions and do different kinds of statistics. So I'm going to focus today on this side of the table. We're also doing this work, but it's a different project. So we made a database full of music, uh, and you recognize this Perotin of the 13th century. We've got some other music from the 13th century. Unfortunately, there's not very much written music in the 13th century, which makes the statistical analysis sometimes a bit problematic. In the 14th century, there's more music and in the 15th and 16th, much more music, no problem, stacks of music. And we've got some other centuries here represented, you know, you recognize your favorite composers in the list here. We made a big database of this music, and you can see how big the database is. The number of notes, which is, you know, like the circle with the tag on it, the number of notes in the entire database is about 7,000 in the 13th century, 8,000 in the 14th. And after that, we made it approximately constant about 20,000. Right. We would like to have more music from this century, but there just is not very much available. Uh, and uh, we made some assumptions when making the database. We, we have to assume that the transcription to modern notation is okay, and there's a, a whole history of this problem, how to transcribe old scores, which I will not tell you about, right? And after that, there's a question of transcribing into a computer-readable format, which also can produce errors. And we're assuming that the errors are not important for the purpose of our, our particular research. They might be important for another piece of research. Um, just to uh, give you the basics of music theory in one minute, uh, here is a piano. You've seen it before. It's got 88 keys on it, right? Uh, today, I'm not going to talk about all those keys. I'm only going to talk about one octave of the piano going like this, C, C sharp, D, up to B, which is called H in German, right? B. And B flat in English is called B in German, okay? And I'm going to assume those 12 notes can be put in a circle like this. And I'll just talk about those pitches which we call pitch classes in music theory. Um, and the next thing I'm, I'm going to say is, um, imagine we're doing a little bit of mathematics here. We want to know all possible combination of pitch classes. So we have this keyboard here with 12 notes in it. Those 12 notes, and we want to uh, explore mathematically all possible combinations of those 12. So we have a chord like this, which sounds really great. That's 012, right? 012. And then we have 013, 014, 015, 016, 017. And then we have 0, 2, 3, right? and you can go through all possibilities that way. That's what I've notated here. And we're going to look in the database and find how often these chords happen. So we'll be completely systematic. Every possible chord is included. Um, so now we're going to look at the question of simultaneous consonants and dissonance. And here's another little tiny introduction to music theory. Um, in this case here, we have an interval called a minor seven which is supposed to be a dissonance. It goes like this. That interval is dissonant in music theory. And um, this example here is more dissonant because the tones happened at the same time. In this case, one tone happened before, and this is a common procedure in early music to take one note of a dissonance and start it early so that the two tones do not sound so dissonant. And so we have to consider that as well when we look at our database. We separate prepared chords from unprepared chords. Uh, 
what do we actually do, right? So here we are in the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities. So I'm now going to tell you about our computer analysis. We took musical scores and we did something very simple and naive, which a music theorist would not like. We said every time there's an onset in a new voice, in any voice, we make a new chord. So we said this is a chord, and this is a chord. Now, in this case, this tone is continuing, and we assume that tone is part of the second chord. So the second chord has four voices, one, two, three, four, and the last one down here is simply held from the last chord. Um, and even if just one tone changes, like this one over here, we assume that there is a chord. So this tone here, and this one, and this one, and this one. So this is not the same as a chord progression that a music theorist would tell you about, but it's the easiest way to do it with the computer, and we don't have another solution. So we divided all the pieces of music into chord progressions like this, and we uh, then counted how often the chords happened. And um, this is from an enormous period of time, from the 13th to the 19th century. We looked at all of the chords in all of the music, and we found out, no surprise, the most common chord in three tones, right, is the major triad, followed by the minor triad, and then the suspended triad, uh, which sounds like this. This, so this is major, minor, suspended, and then diminished. And after that, there's something I call squash. And there's another one called squeeze. And I call them squash and squeeze, these ones here, because they have no name in music theory. I had to call them something. It's like naming your pet dog. I had no name for them. And after that, there's one here called augmented. Um, so we found out some basic things about music theory that way. Uh, here are these chords in a list, starting with the most common one. Uh, each one we can talk about either with musical notes or in the number of semitones relative to the root. So a major triad goes 0, 4, 7, 4 semitones. So semitones higher than this and 7 semitones higher than this, right? So these are the main chords that are used in major and minor tonality. And here we can see what happens in different centuries. Um, in the 13th century, when uh, polyphony was just getting started, there were lots of different chords happening. And um, the major and minor triads were happening, but lots of other ones were happening as well. And gradually, during this period up to the 16th century, the major and minor triads, which today we think are the most familiar and obvious chords, right, they became completely dominant over the other chords here. So the third one is suspended, and squash and squeeze are really small. So there was a, there was a period uh, when the major and minor triads were used more and more, and the other chords were used less and less. And we assume from that that the people listening to the music and composing the music became familiar with the sounds of the chords and recognized that some were more consonant than others and gradually preferred the more consonant ones. Here are some chords of four tones, and this is kind of obvious, right? This is called a note. So the next thing I wanted to do was try to explain why some chords happen more often than others. And um, there's one psychological theory that says that there's something happening in your inner ear, on the basilar membrane of your inner ear, uh, which causes a sensation called roughness. And roughness, psychoacoustical roughness, is uh, for many people the foundation of dissonance. So the theory is if the chord is more rough, you expect it to happen less often. So we need a model of roughness, and there are different possible models. <coughs> Here is a very simple one. These are all possible chords uh, of three tones, the first two lines. And here are the number of semitones in the chords, and we could just say the number of semitones. Semitones sound like this, right? The number of time we get this bad sound is the measure of roughness. And you could also measure the number of tritones, which also sounds rough. So you can make a simple model of roughness, and you could also make a co more complicated model of roughness, uh, where every interval from one up to six semitones gets a different value depending on some assumptions. So we, we tried these things out, and we found out uh, that the simple model, which has just got semitones in it, the number of semitones, gives you a significant correlation between the frequency of occurrence of the chord and the predicted roughness, right? It works 
significantly well, but the more complex models work better. So we were quite happy about this result, right? The, the more information you put in the model, the more you can predict about the frequency of occurrence of the court. And this is the more complex model up here. And it worked for all of those different centuries quite consistently. You can see the correlation coefficient is only 0 0.5, and so that means it's only accounting for 0 0.25 of the variance, which is maybe not so good. So then we tried this with uh, chords of prepared chords and unprepared chords, and we looked at chords of four tones, and basically we came to the same conclusion, that the roughness model seems to work, and if we have a more sophisticated model, it works better. Um, so the next thing we, we wanted to find out was if the, if the chords happen more often, if they're more harmonic. And that's another well-known theory from the history of uh, psychoacoustics. Um, uh, Karl Stumpf in the 19th century said that consonants in music is based on something called fusion or Verschmelzung. And fusion is based on the harmonic series, which is a pattern of pitches inside a tone or a chord. And so we created a model of this thing called harmonicity, which is quite different from roughness. Roughness happens in your ear, and harmonicity happens in your brain. It's a, it's a kind of pattern recognition. So we made a model of this. Again, we make a very simple model, and we discovered that the simple model, again, gave a significant correlation between the frequency of occurrence of the chords in the different centuries. And if we used a more sophisticated model, which I've got here, uh, of harmonic harmonicity of chords, we got a better correlation going up here. So that was good. We thought, you know, we're making progress now. Uh, we seem to be able to account for the frequency of occurrence of chords. Uh, something similar for prepared chords, unprepared chords. Uh, then there's another another measure of harmonicity which I did in a paper about the root of the chord, and I tried to apply that one, and I found out that uh, this other model got even better, and we're up here by 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 correlation for this model of harmonicity. So, long story, um, and then we looked at tetrachords, and we found it was a bit more complicated, and I don't know what happened. There's something funny happening with chords of four tones, and this is what happens in research, you know, you don't necessarily understand what's going on, but in general, we can still say that, ha that harmonicity is working. Um, and then we dreamt up another model which is called diatonicity. Another possible model is that there's a scale called the major scale, which is also called a diatonic scale. If the tones of a chord are inside that scale, you expect it to happen more often. And that would mean that a more diatonic chord should happen more than a less diatonic chord. So we made a model of that as well. And we found out that diatonicity did not work so well. Unprepared chords, prepared chords, so the conclusion of this whole modeling exercise was that roughness and harmonicity, here called pitch salience, we have good evidence that they really exist, and this is confirming what people were guessing before. But there's been a long discussion about this, whether, whether consonants and dissonance are based on roughness and, or harmonicity, and we think that we found the answer that um, it's based on both. Um, and I'll skip that now. So. Um, so, summarizing, the prevalence of vertical pitch class sets of chords depends on roughness, harmonicity, and familiarity. And the evidence for familiarity is the, the changing distributions that I showed you from one century to the next. So, we can conclude from this that people back in the Renaissance and in the late medi medieval period were hearing something like chords, which we call chords today, but they had no vocabulary for that. In the history of music theory, there was no one talking about chords, and they did not even use a word like sonority. They only talked about intervals, which are two tones, right? And uh, so we can conclude from this study of the databases that people were perceiving the quality of a chord like we do today, but they had no way to talk about it. Part two, horizontal consonants and dissonance. How does one chord go with another chord after it. And we're going to answer this question by asking how often does a given pitch class or tone proceed or follow a given chord. So if I just play this chord, I can ask the question, how often is the next tone this one? Right? And how often is the next tone this one? 
And you can easily do this looking at the database. So um, uh, this is what happens. We, had, we took a selection of chords. The first one of here is called 015, which sounds like this. And we looked how often tones happen before and after that chord. And of course, we can't look at this graph now. I just wanted to show you we have data. And we can look at the data in the 13th century and in the 19th century. It's very similar. You can't look at it now, sorry. Um, here are the major and minor triads. The question is, how often do certain tones happen before and after these chords in real music? Right? So the major triad is on this, is over here. Da, 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 right? These are the three tones. And here's the minor triad. Da, ba, ba. Uh, four semitones here is a minor third, and three semitones here is a, ma a, sorry, a major third and a minor third. Um, and you can see here that before and after, the tones happening before and after are almost the same. There's not much difference between before and after. So that was the first thing we found out. Little difference between preceding and following. We also found out, I can't show you now, that there's not actually very much difference between different centuries. And so this particular way of looking at music shows that um, there's not much difference between centuries. And so we suggest that these profiles depend mainly on the sound of the chord itself. And so then the question is, what exactly is the sound of the chord itself? We don't really know what that is. And so why, for example, does this tone here go together with the rest of the chord? Because this tone is not in the chord, right? And this tone here is not in the chord, and this one is not in the chord here. Why do those tones go with the chords? Right? This is a kind of fundamental music psychology question. Um, here is a possible answer to this question where you see that this graph looks very similar to the last one. You can't see it very quickly, but in fact they correlate very highly. Um, these graphs are graphs of the stability of tones in the scale. So, um, so you know if I play this scale, um, there's a tone up here called the leading tone. And if you stop on that one, you think it hasn't finished, right? And you feel very nervous until I finish it, right? And so this idea of instability is illustrated by this tone. And um, this is like a graph of stability. And you can do a psychological experiment to find out how stable the pitches are. And this corresponds to how often they happen, right? It's very simple. So um, here we've got how often a tone happens before or after a chord. And here we have how stable the chord is, and we have some other predictions based on a model, and they're all corresponding to each other. So we think that we've got a simple explanation now for why certain tones happen more often than others. So um, the next thing we did is we said, all right, we've got profiles, and we want to explain them. We're going to look at the chord tones. These are the ones in the chord here, one, two, three. And we're going to look at the other ones which are not in the chord. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are three tones in the chord and there are nine tones not in the chord. And we want to explain the variation in these two sets with different models. So that was the, our next task. We want to try to explain this variation with models. And so, um, first of all, we looked at the three chord tones and we found out that tones which are likely to be held or repeated, so come from the last chord to the next chord to the one after, are uh, often the root of a chord. And the root of a chord is a contour, and this is a basic thing out of music theory. So that was not very surprising, but it's actually not so clear. And then we looked at the non-chord tones, the, the tones in the chromatic scale which are not the tones of the chord. We compared four different theories to try to explain the variation in the profile. And these theories are called diatonic tones. So first of all, diatonic tones. If I play this chord and ask you which other tones will go with this chord, you would say, well, probably the tones of the same major scale, right? So this is a major chord, and here's a major scale. So you would expect those tones to happen with this chord. But then also there's another major scale which has this chord in it. I just changed one note and got another major scale. And so it's a bit complicated to find out which tones 
for go with which chord according to this principle of diatonic tones. That's one possible mathematical predictor which we developed, right? The second one is the interval of a perfect fifth is preferred. The third one is something called missing fundamentals, which I'll explain in a minute. And the fourth one is completion tones. Um, if you hear a chord and another tone, it makes a new chord. And does the new chord sound familiar or not, is the question. So we, we developed a model to try to explain this, and it's based on these four factors here. And the third one, missing fundamentals, I should describe briefly so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, a fundamental is like the fundamental of a harmonic series, um, de, de contorn eine harmonischen Weihe, right? And a harmonic series is inside some chords, incomplete, it's an incomplete pattern, and we assume that the fundamental is perceived even if it's not there. And if we take this chord here, C, E, G, uh, we could say that C and, or we could say that the tone A, which is in the bass here, that that is a fundamental if E is one of the harmonics and G is another harmonic. Uh, you can search for possible fundamentals of incomplete harmonic series in a systematic way, and you find out that some tones are expected to be perceived for this reason. And um, this was one of our models, right? Um, and this is very complicated, but we made a very specific prediction for every chord. We've got nine chords here. For every chord, we have a specific prediction of tones that we think will happen more often. And we systematically compared these theories with each other, whether they predict the data or not, and which one is the best one. And so from this a very brief summary, um, we found out that the diatonic theory predicted most of the variation of the nine tones which are not in the chord, right? And we, but we were completely unsurprised. Of course diatonic scales, is, everyone's writing diatonic music, right? And we're also unsurprised by this because diatonic scales are based on intervals of a perfect fifth. But the next thing which we found interesting is that missing fundamentals did seem to predict the variation. So we have evidence that people are perceiving these tones over here which are not notated in the chords. This is a, an important part of the whole theory. People perceive things that are not there. Right? That's a very interesting phenomenon. And also the tones that complete chords predicted some of the variants. So, um, in summary, um, we could ask a general question, does perception of music chords depend on nature or nurture? Anlage oder Umwelt, right? And um, the results suggest that both of these things are important. So, there, is a, there are general um, perceptual phenomena, universal principles, roughness, harmonic pattern recognition, which people in every musical culture would perceive, but we also have culture-specific patterns which influence our perception. Um, we can explain the origin of major and minor scales by a simple theory. Um, so this is a basic question like, why is the sky blue? Why does the C major scale have these notes in it? And why does the minor scale have other notes in it? And you would think that the music theorist could answer this question, but in fact they can't. It's very surprising. There are many different people trying to explain this, and there's no, there's no common explanation for this. Why does a minor scale have a certain tones in it? And so we have a theory here based on missing fundamentals in the leading tone. Um, a psychohistorical model. What actually happened in the history of perception? So how did the perception of people change when the music changed? So this theory goes like this. First of all, we got polyphony. People started to sing melodies more or less independently. The tones were somehow independent. And then people got used to consonants and dissonance of different combinations. So people got used to appreciating the smoothness of some chords and the harmonicity of some chords, and they started to prefer, prefer those chords. And then major and minor triads emerged as the most smooth and harmonic chords, and they were dominating all the other chords. And then the horizontal thing began to stable, so stab to stabilize. The horizontal aspect means that you have a certain chord and after that certain tones happen more often. And that began to stabilize the profile of preceding and following tones. And finally, 
the major and minor triads became tonic triads, which meant that we had major and minor keys. Right? So this is our historical model. And there's a whole lot of stuff that I did not talk about today, which comes out of the history of music theory. And if any music theorists were here, they might um, get angry at me for leaving them out. But I have good reasons for leaving out theories that I think are not very useful. So there's an idea from Pythagoras that musical intervals are ratios of whole numbers. Like whole numbers. I left it out. I don't think it's actually true. Uh, there's a theory that voice leading can explain our data. I don't think it's true. The way the voices move to get to a chord. Uh, there's a theory that you have to look at individual examples to understand this problem, but in fact I never showed you, well at the start I just showed you a couple, but we don't need specific examples, we just look at statistics. Delusions of cultural superiority, well the history of music theory is full of people who believe that their own music is better than other people's music. I didn't have to talk about that. I thought you'd like that. Mathematical group theory, uh, I know people in mathematics and music and they talk about these very weird theories and I, I don't think that they help solve this problem. And finally, neuroscience. Well, of course, everything's happening in your brain, but I don't think that knowing about your brain will help you to solve these problems. So here are the people in my centre. One or two of them are here, only one. Uh, and I would like to thank them for helping, especially, da especially Daniel Reisinger, uh, who did a lot of work on this project, and also people who used to be student assistants, um, who unfortunately cannot be present. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you.